Communications. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the managing editor for the CJE, uh, Catherine Cuff, Kate Cuff, um, who was one of my profs when I was in grad school, uh, probably headed for, or at least among in the discussion for nicest prof at McMaster. That's a department that includes Mike Veal, uh, which is a, a stellar accomplishment in itself. Uh, so you all know Kate, uh, first-rate scholar, and uh, we thank her for her service to the journal, and I'm going to give her a few minutes to uh, welcome you all to the session. Great, thank you. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, as Grant said, that was a very nice welcome. I wasn't expecting that myself. Uh, I wanted to uh, actually, uh, on behalf of the journal, welcome all of you to this first joint webinar between the Canadian Research Data Centre Network and the Canadian Journal of Economics. I'm uh, actually super excited to be here this afternoon with you, and I hope that this is going to be the first of many such webinars. So what I'd like to do, of course, is give a big thank you to the team at CRDCN for undertaking the organization of the webinar, and in particular, uh, Joanne Provencel, Perry Abdullah, and of course, Grant Gibson, who is going to be hosting uh, today's uh, session. So thank you as well to our two authors for both contributing to our special issue on COVID-19, and this special issue will be coming out later this fall. As well, uh, thank you to both of them for taking the time to tell us about their papers. Um, and finally, a big thank you to all of you who are attending uh, today's webinar. I look forward to your questions and to the discussion. So thanks again. Okay, thanks, Kate. Uh, so our first uh, presenter today is uh, Pierre-Lou Beauregard. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at uh, British uh, UBC, um, and he's working on uh, Oh, a paper on primary school reopenings. So take it away, Pierre Lou. All right, thank you, Grant. Thank you, Kate. Uh, start. I can't share my screen. Yeah, Grant. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you for inviting me. So today I'm talking about this paper called Primary School Reopening and Parental Work. It's uh, with Marie Conley and Katrina Hack, both at UCAM, and Timia Laura Molnar at Central Open University. So as the title might give it away, uh, the question we're asking ourselves uh, here is how did primary school uh, closure during the pandemic affect parental work uh, in Canada? So what we do is first we describe parental work patterns uh, during the pandemic and then we exploit uh, geographic patterns of school closures or actually reopening so the flip side of closures uh, to understand the impact of school closure uh, on parental work. So we use here a triple difference model. And so we use this model to estimate um, the effects on both mothers and fathers, but also according to family structure. So either the parents are in single parents households or in dual parent households. Uh, our main findings are that uh, first, primary school reopenings has a positive effect on employment for parents. Uh, it has a generally stronger effect for single mothers, um, but also for parents and dual parents also. But what we see that single mothers experience a, a 18 percentage, percentage points increase in the employment uh, at work uh, flow. Um, so uh, a big impact there. And we see that obviously this impact is stronger for people whose job cannot be done remotely. So a little bit about the early literature uh, on this matter. Uh, first, we know that the lockdown measures uh, led to uh, obviously a big impact on the labor market. So we know that it has a lot uh, a strong effect for parents um, on their employment, but also on their power work. And we also know that it had an impact on the gender gap of probability of being employed so between uh, mothers and, and fathers. And we also know from studies in, in different countries that uh, mothers tend to uh, spend more time homeschooling than their, their male counterpart. So 
So here, that's that's exactly why we're estimating this model for 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 mothers and fathers of Earth. So in Canada, uh, schools school primary school closed uh, everywhere within a week. So between March 13 and March 20. So basically, at the same time, closed countrywide. Uh, we know that the those closure were coming with uh, an array of other uh, lockdown measures, and they, they also add a significant impact on, uh, on the labor market. And then we know that since school closed, children were homeschooled um, with a various level of, of, of support from the schools. So that's across the country, so between provinces, but also within provinces. So that's something to know. So since uh, school closed at all at the same time, it's not really possible to use this variation to estimate the effect. But the, the reopenings actually took place uh, with a different time. So that's what we're using to, to estimate uh, this effect. So here is uh, the calendar of school uh, closures and opening uh, between provinces. So we see uh, in March 2020, school closed everywhere. It was still closed in April. But then in May, uh, school reopened in Quebec, uh, outside Montreal, uh, greater area. So that's the first discrepancy we're using uh, to estimate the, 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 the effect of school closures on, on parental work. So the first version of the paper actually only used this uh, discrepancy there. And then we have in the fall, school were open, mostly open everywhere. Obviously, um, that had, there, there was some um, protocol. So if we had a COVID case, classes should close for like, like two weeks or something, uh, but it was mostly open. But then in January 2021, school reclosed in Southern Ontario. So that's the second discrepancy we're using to estimate the effect. Um, the data we're using is the labor force survey from January 2017 to uh, January 2021. So for those of you who are not familiar with the, the LFS, it's a monthly survey. It's mandatory. It's used to compute unemployment rates in Canada. And it also uh, provides information on regions. So we're using the, the CMAs here so we can have uh, 94 regions here. And in our sample, we're using, we're having, we have two groups actually. So we're keeping all parents of uh, 20 year old of age to 55. Um, and the two groups we have is parents of primary school children. So children aged uh, from six to 12 and high school children. So aged 13 to 17. And we exclude households that have both primary school and secondary school uh, children. Um, we use all months except the summer months, so June, July, and August. And then we run a bunch of tests to, uh, to validate uh, those choices. So if we look at our two groups, uh, they're very similar. The main difference is obviously the age. Parents of older children tend to be older, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and they're also a little bit more in, in single parents also. So if we look here, but other than that, the two groups are very similar. And the two, the three variables we're using as um, uh, labor market outcomes is the fact of being employed at work. So when I say at work, it's not physically at work, it's actually working. So it can be remotely in uh, being employed. So, but not necessarily working. So it's only having an employment link with an employer. And then we use actual how it worked uh, during the week. So again, two groups are very similar. Um, so it's a good indication that we have a good uh, control group. Now, uh, looking at this figure, it's, it seems a little dense. So uh, I'll try to be clear here. So this is uh, the employment rate at work of parents, um, according to the, three, to the three regions we're looking at. So here we see it's fairly similar. And then here's the pandemic that hurt, hits. So we said big drop, 
And in the red markers here are for the month of May and here for the month of January 2021. So here we see a big drop, but what we're really interested in is what happened in the next month. So here, if we look at Quebec outside Montreal, schools reopen and we see this big jump here. And uh, so it almost got back to the previous levels. So this is for fathers and dual parents also, but we see similar stuff for uh, mothers here. So here again, a big jump here when the other region, they, they, they got back a little bit, but it's still uh, fairly low. And we, if we look at single parents, well, here the standard deviation are quite big because of the uh, reduced number of observation, but we see similar patterns. So here, uh, the, the diamond here of Quebec goes back here. Um, and for mothers, it, it's not as clear. And for the month of January, when school were closed in Southern Ontario, the effect is not as clear. And we'll see that in the, the, the estimation results. So our approach, as I said, is a triple difference model. So here, why is or labor market outcomes? We have fixed effect for regions and uh, for year month. Uh, and we have a bunch of socioeconomic variables to control. And we also have fixed effect for uh, the occupation of the parents and their industry. But the coefficient we're really looking at is this triple difference coefficient here. So this is when school are open in Quebec in May and they're closed everywhere else. And here is uh, not Southern Ontario. So that's Quebec outside Montreal plus the rest of Canada in January. And so this is the effect of having school open. So if we look at our main results first, here we see uh, for, for fathers, it's not significant. So there are basically no effects uh, on, on father uh, labor market outcomes, uh, nor for mothers and dual parents also. So we see that the only uh, significant coefficients are for single mothers. Uh, so we see a 18.1 percentage point increase here uh, that's being employed at work, uh, a little less for being employed, uh, no regards on working or not. And we see a, a good effect on actual hour work. So 7.6 hours uh, for the reference week. Um, but we go further. So here uh, we actually decompose the effect for only the month of May and only the month of January. And we see that actually for the month of May, there's an effect for mothers and dual parents households as well as fathers and dual parents households. So a uh, nine percent point here, 9.8 percentage point increase here. So it actually had an effect on, on parents and dual parents also. But we, if we look at the month of January, there's basically no effects for those groups. And what we think happens here is um, in May, uh, parents didn't have time to uh, deal with this or uh, also, school were supposed to be closed for the rest of the school here. So uh, it had a big impact. Um, but in January, when it closed, uh, it was supposed to be only one month. So the parents didn't really adapt to the closures. So that's, that's what we think is going on here. Uh, now, if we look at uh, the results according to the ability to work from home, we see something interesting. So as we would expect, uh, if we look at jobs uh, can be done remotely, there's not much effect. So no effects in, in January, weird negative effect in, in January, um, but basically no effects for parents whose job can be done remotely. The real problem is parents who have jobs that cannot be done remotely. So uh, here we see that for mothers, big impact, also for fathers and dual parents households. So in May, to work, uh, so that, that's, that's good, uh, right. Um, and for mothers, there's still a, a big impact even in the month of January. So even though they, they adapt, uh, they, they simply can't uh, stay home and, and, and work at the same time. So obviously, 
uh, re school reopening at good effects for them. Um, so if we look at our conclusion, so for the month of May 2020, uh, when school reopened, uh, it had a big, if a good impact on parental work. So they could go back to work. We see a 21.8 percentage point increase for single mothers. So that's in May when the school reopened first um, in Quebec outside Montreal. And then, uh, but if we only look at the month of May, we see that there is an effect for uh, uh, parents and dual parents also. So 9.0 percentage increase for mothers, 9.8 percentage increase uh, for fathers. And we also have limited evidence that uh, it, it helped change the employment status. So irrespective on if people are working, but they actually got employed. But uh, keep in mind that this takes more time to jump from unemployment to being employed to being employed, not working to working. So we have to keep that in mind. And in January, 2021, uh, regions that maintain school open, helped single mother to, to stay employed and to stay working. Um, and it also increased their uh, hour worked by 7.3 hours per week. So uh, keeping primary school open helps single mothers participate in the labor market, but it also, uh, but the de decision of keeping the school open or closed uh, should actually take into account a lot of stuff. So obviously, uh, the well-being of the parents and the kids, but also of the workers in the school system. Um, and we know that from the literature that having school closed for a long period of time will have effects on students. Uh, so on their perseverance, their academic achievement. And this is especially true for low socioeconomic status uh, students. So, so obviously this is a, a really multi-phase problem, um, but it has a lot of consequences. So uh, this is a, a tricky question, uh, and we hope our findings here might uh, contribute uh, to the debate. Thank you. Okay, so somebody uh, has told me that the Q&A button is not activated. Um, cannot be clicked. That's interesting. Okay, so other people are saying it's working. So if there's uh, questions for Pierre Lou, um, okay, everyone's saying it's working. It's just uh, uh, one person who said it couldn't. So hopefully it's working for you now. Um, so we'll, Pierre Lou will take anyone's uh, questions for, uh, I guess, five minutes until, uh, until it's time for Derek to present. Thank you, uh, Pierre Lou and team, for documenting um, documenting this uh, this effect of, of policy. Can I just jump in with a question while we wait? For yeah, someone? go for it. Um, so, Pierre Lou, oh, and one thing I just if you could just sort of explain. So, the idea is taking this control group of the of the families that have the high school kids. You're then controlling for the fact that with a school closure, of course, there's limited employment opportunities, right? So if the hair salon that I work at closes at the same time, then that's accounted for in that respect. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so we argued that the primary school parents, uh, pr primary school children's parents and um, high school children's parents are living the same others um, measure, health measure. So that, that's why, because when schools reopened, for instance, in Quebec in May, uh, it was also uh, with an array of modif modification of the measures. So if we control for another similar group, uh, then, then we kind of take this into account. So we, we think we really isolate the effect of just the, the the primary school reopening, because keep in mind that the high school did not reopen Canada wide. Right. So I guess you could also, I mean, in future work, take advantage of the fact that in Ontario, of course, we, we went back to, in person and then we closed again and then we went back in person. <laughs> so you could actually, no, we didn't go back in person. <laughs> we just never went back. Uh, but do you think you'd find similar results if you were to, to look at that as well? So, uh, so 
you mean if we kept more month uh, after January, so like February, okay. Um, so what we see here is the effect for January is not that strong. And that, that we think this is because uh, parents could adapt uh, after almost, uh, almost a year then. Um, so I'm not sure if we would see as strong effect um, but but we think we would still have these uh, those high like great effects for single mothers. Thank you. I, th I see you have a question, so I'll let Grant take over. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so Pelu, there's a request to go back to your uh, uh, statistical model and explain your identification strategy again. So yeah, here we're using a a, a triple difference uh, model. So the first difference is uh, in time. And the first like difference of difference model is in time and geographically. So uh, in May in Quebec school reopened. So that's just a basic uh, difference and difference model. And then we had another difference uh, for uh, controlling on the second group, which is uh, high school children parents. So that's the, the P1 equals zero and the P1 equal one. And, and then we have those like, interaction terms, but this is really what we're looking for here is the effect of this is cool being open in Quebec in May and closed everywhere. And this is the effect of uh, school being open everywhere in January, except Southern Ontario. Does that answer your question? I think we'll assume it does unless uh, he comes back in the chat. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay. Is there anything else for uh, Pierre-Lou? Is it a monthly difference or yearly? So the coefficient on May refers to May relative to April or relative to May in 2019? Uh, it's relative to... Uh, so since we have this uh, year-month effect, so it's more would be, I mean, it's more an employment level uh, overall. So if we look at, uh, so it, it would be compared to the province, usually the province at, uh, in a year month fixed effect. So it, it, it's an absolute difference, if I could say. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I can answer that, Henry. Uh, so we actually double checked this. Uh, so here we estimated. So the question is, uh, we didn't include families with both primary school and secondary school kids. Um, so the the argument here is that if if the family has uh, high school children, they can care for their younger siblings. So it's not the, the parents that are actually caring. Maybe they are, but there's something going on here. But we did a check with uh, if we include uh, those families. So here um, we see that this effect is, so this is only for mothers, but the effect is still strong for single mothers, uh, but basically no effects for, for mothers and, and, and the all parents also. So similar to what we had if we did not include those families. Okay, so if anything else comes up for anybody, we can uh, come back to Pierre Lou at the end of the session. Um, but we'll get uh, we'll get Derek to uh, to put his slides up. Excellent, thank you. Join us. So Derek is a fourth year uh, PhD candidate at Carleton uh, University. I was working on labor markets, COVID nineteen, and is also interested in the opioid epidemic. And I'm given to understand that Derek is going to be on the job market this year. So. Oh, uh, I think I'll be on the job market next year. But Okay, next year. <laughs> All right. But, but thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Anyway, so yeah, uh, thank you, Pierre-Lou, for the, for the excellent presentation, which came before. And 
uh, to Kate and Grant for organizing this. It's it's been a been a pleasure and, and very seamless. And so, as uh, Grant said, I'm a PhD student at Carleton. I'm in fourth year, entering fifth year. Hopefully, in the market in sixth year. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about the short-term economic consequences of COVID-19, with particular emphasis on occupational tasks and the, and mental health in Canada. And so, this was joint research uh, with Louis Philippe Ballon, de Val Brodeur, and Taylor Wright. Uh, and I and we're all very happy to be a part of this kind of first uh, CRDC CJE series, and especially the COVID-19 special issue webinar. So, thank you very much for having us, and and uh, I hope you enjoy the chat. Maybe. All right, so it's no, it's no mystery to anyone that COVID-19 has highly impacted uh, the lives of us Canadians and, and pretty much everyone around the world. This is in fact a global pandemic. And so just as a motivation, in case you haven't really been aware of anything in the past year and a half, between January and December of 2020, we had a huge number of COVID cases um, throughout Canada and throughout the world. And this has highly impacted kind of how we operate in, and in particular labor market outcomes as it responds to government uh, interventions and kind of public health initiatives to try and reduce the cases associated with COVID-19. As an excellent example in a, in a great paper, Pierre Loup kind of discusses the impacts of you know, uh, child care and, and kind of labor market decisions by those uh, impacted or, or some of those groups most mostly impacted. And so when we started thinking about what we would like to do with, with, this, with this research, we were thinking about, okay, well, how is Canada and how is the Canadian economy reacting to COVID-19? And this was especially important when we conceived the idea in, in late March, early April, when provincial governments were, were imposing social and physical distancing policies, they were shutting down non-essential businesses, and all of our lives are radically altered, right? This is, this is just take it for granted. And as an example, all of the schools shut down in one week in March of, of 20, 2020. And so what we aim to do was trying to understand how COVID-19 has impacted the Canadian labor market, and in particular, how different occupations and given the characteristics of those occupations might have different outcomes. And more importantly, uh, with, the, with the advent of the CPSS and that being released, released in, in May of 2020, we are trying to understand other avenues through which uh, Canadians might be affected by COVID-19. And so just reiterating that it's not just the number of cases, right? It's not just getting a flu. It's not like previous uh, kind of SARS or, or swine flu things which came before us, that there actually aren't huge repercussions to not controlling the deaths. And especially as we potentially enter the fourth wave, where other countries are entering the fourth wave with the onset of the Delta variant, we are trying to still grapple with this global pandemic. It's still a massive issue. And this was the same, and this goes uh, the same for kind of labor markets and labor markets in Canada. And so the unemployment rate kind of spikes in March and April before kind of coming back towards trend by January 2021, uh, and similarly for the labor force participation. And this is probably no news to anyone, but at the time it was very interesting to get the, the new LFS and run these numbers and see what the graphs were looking like. And so today what I hope to talk to you about is kind of give you an overview of the paper and, and kindly push you towards the CJE special issue to read the paper and kind of come back to us with additional questions and inquiries, but we'll try and summarize some of the key facts or key um, conclusions from our paper. And so we, of course, we, we, we characterize the increase in unemployment and the decrease in labor force participation rate. We, we take a stab at actual hours worked and real hourly wages as well. But most importantly, our contribution is trying to use the variation in characteristics of occupations to, to understand labor market outcomes. And so, for example, one of our indexes working in close proximity to others led to worse labor market outcomes. While those who could transition, transition to work from home or telework or those who are considered critical or essential workers, or those who are more likely to work in medical professionals, professions, sorry, had smaller impacts on their labor markets, right? And so we're talking about the differential uh, for an occupation. And so while all of the labor, all labor markets kind of got worse, some did worse and some did better, and that's a key part of, of this paper. Now, at the same time, at the end of this, we, we try and understand different avenues. And so one example, and using the CPSS, we can investigate kind of correlations between mental health and how it affects some workers. And especially today, I'll show you women were, were impacted more, at least at, at, through a correlation. Uh, moreover, those absent from work due to COVID are more concerned with meeting financial obligations and keeping their jobs. And so all we were trying to do was characterize the, the initial kind of, how is it impacting us? 
what, what variation can we use? Perhaps we can use variation occupations at the onset of COVID. And then how are other avenues to which uh, COVID is affecting Canadians? Um, and so if you'll excuse me, we'll just jump right into the data sources and, and ignore the literature. It is a 15 minute talk. And thankfully for me, Pierre Luc did an excellent job describing the Canadian labor force survey. And we're gonna be using approximately the same time period. So January, 2016 to December, 2020, when we talk about our indexes, we're actually gonna use January, 2017 to December, 2020. And we're gonna use that, that LFS data with various index data from ONET, um, from the Labor Market Information Institute. So that should be LMI, apologies and Dingle and Neiman's Journal of Public uh, Economics Work from Home Index, which is readily available online. And so a lot, of the, a lot of this work that we did was trying to integrate kind of these more American index and occupation, sorry, more American occupation characteristics uh, stats or just um, numbers and integrate them into the Canadian uh, labor force survey. And so what we do is we use a crosswalk between the SOC and the NOC, and then we're gonna uh, successively weight uh, based on census of population shares in order to get uh, NOC uh, 40 group indexes. And we can talk about that a little bit more later and even at the end of the discussion. And But that buys us this, this variation occupations. And finally, we're going to use the CPSS. Okay, so the labor force survey, nationally representative monthly household level data, and it creates major, large, major labor market indicators uh, for Canada. So this is released every I think it's the first Thursday of every month. Um, and Pierre Luke did an excellent job of describing it. But for the most part, it's just all the socioeconomic variables you might want, which can give you major labor market indicators. Uh, if you're not used to the labor force survey and more familiar with American data, you can think of this as the Canadian equivalent of the CPS. Um, now, at the same time, we're going to build four indexes to understand how individuals facing different work conditions are impacted differently over the course of the pandemic. And so we're going to build a, all these indexes are going to be standardized to be mean zero with a standard deviation of one. Okay. And for the most part, or sorry, for exclusively, as we increase the value, so as you get further positive beyond this mean zero, we're going to say you're more likely to work in physical proximity to coworkers, or you're more likely to work in a profession which is which is exposed to disease and, and infection on a daily basis, or you're more likely to be classified as a critical worker, or you're more likely to be able to work from home or telework. And so that's pretty much how we, we're, we're going to interpret these. And we're gonna interpret these as kind of standard deviation increases away from the mean. And finally, the CPSS. So I, I recognize that this is fairly familiar. We're gonna be using the first wave of the CPSS. It's nationally representative cross-sectional data that asks COVID-19 related questions to individuals in Canada. Um, again, socioeconomic variables are all included and it asks about individuals' mental health, financial concerns, and if they're, if they're concerned with losing their jobs. In, in the paper, we show a kind of a comparison of the CPSS to the LFS across key demographics, and they do a pretty good job of matching uh, this time. And when, when you originally undertook this, I don't think we had access to the uh, supplemental questions of the labor force survey. And so this was a, a really kind of great survey, which, which gave us a little bit of grip on mental health issues in additional avenues. And the empirical strategy, which we plan to employ is, is pretty much going to be using this exogenous variation, i.e. a pandemic hitting in March of 2020. And we're going to assume that between March, 2020 and December, 2020, uh, the pandemic is, is on, right? So this will be an indicator variable. So if you're in a labor force survey within March um, uh, through December, 2020, you will be considered like within the pandemic. And we're gonna be using this uh, just to do very basic before and after regressions. And then we're going to interact the indexes which we construct with this before and after indicator. And this will give us kind of the differential impact based on occupations uh, before finally getting to some cross-sectional analysis. So these would just be correlations using the, uh, the CPSS as a cross section. Okay, so the model for the before and after is pretty simple. Uh, the coefficient of interest would be this beta associated with a variable post COVID, excuse me, which takes on an indicator equal to one between March and December, 2020 and zero for all preceding months. Um, time range, January, 2016 to December, 2020. We're gonna have, we're gonna have a whole bunch of socio-demographic uh, other, other regressors just to control for individuals, age group, gender, marital status and education level and a handful of provincial and time fixed effects. 
So it's a pretty, it's a very simple idea kind of to wet your palate for what will be uh, the very obvious worsening of the Canadian labor market. And so as we see in columns three, or in column three, sorry, we see this increase in the unemployment rate of about 0.5 relative to the pre-COVID mean of 0.66. So this means almost a doubling of the unemployment rate during the COVID-19 period. <clears throat> and this is fairly robust to the other two columns with, with all of our, sorry, with all of our controls. Uh, so this, the story is very similar for the labor force participation rate, robust across all of these, uh, all of these specifications. And, and we see a decrease in the labor force participation rate by about 2% relative to a 77% pre-COVID labor force participation. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to interact those indexes, which are mean zero and standard deviation one, with this before and after indicator variable. And so as you can see, the post-COVID variable um, stays about the same, so about 0.05, so an increase of about 0.05 in the unemployment rate in labor force participation, a decrease of about 0.2. Uh, but more importantly, when we interact and focusing both only on the bottom four rows, when we interact with our, um, our indexes, we see uh, different occupations or different care, or people in occupations with varying characteristics of indexes have different, um, have different uh, outcomes. Right, and so if we if we think specifically about post post COVID and physical proximity, if you're in a in an occupation where you have a, a one standard deviation above the mean for physical proximity index, you're going to have about an increase in your unemployment rate of about two percent, right? And so this is actually quite large, right? So this is going from about ten or eleven to about twelve or thirteen. And so if you're working in something like retail sales or you're at a brick and mortar where you're interacting with people quite quite a lot you're more likely to have this high physical proximity measure or this high physical proximity index, and you're also more likely to be unemployed. And the intuition follows for labor force participation. You're less likely to participate in the labor force if you're in, a, a, in, a, in an occupation which has, um, which, which are more likely to be interacting with people in close proximity. Similarly, if you work in a profession more likely to be exposed to disease and infection, your unemployment rate uh, gets slightly better but you're still dwarfed by the general post-COVID average. Um, same with critical workers. So if you're a critical or essential worker, it's not quite so bad. And same if you're able to work from home or telework. And the intuition follows for your labor force participation where it's all dwarfed by the post-COVID average, but some professions can do better to weather this storm. And so that's a big part of, of our story is saying that no, some occupations are, are more highly impacted than others and those which, which those which uh, were less impact were less impacted, maybe still did poorly, but were easier easier to do well in. Finally, we're going to talk about the cross sectional analysis using the CPSF data, and this is just a snippet of from what we did with respect to the CPS CPSS. Uh, but so we we take perceived mental health in an ordered probit model, and we give you the estimated coefficients. So these are not marginal effects. And we can focus your attention to those who are just the whole sample. And we see females are, are less likely to have good mental health. And so the mental health number is, is a value of one for poor all the way up to five for excellent. And so negative values in this case suggest that relative to men, females have worse uh, perceived mental health. And so, so that's one of our findings. Uh, as well, married and common law relative to people who might be single, uh, typically have better perceived mental health at the time of COVID. Um, for those who have high school diploma or equivalent, you have kind of worse mental health. And then interestingly, immigrants have slightly better perceived mental health during the time of COVID relative to non-immigrants. And this is interesting. Um, some of those results hold, especially for women across the only the employed subsamples. But we also can use the, L, the CPSS to understand financial concerns or if they're concerned that they might lose a job in the, in the coming, coming weeks. And so for columns one and two, uh, values, lower values imply major impacts. So you're more likely to be impacted or your financial concerns increase if, if, if you have a negative number. And so if you're employed but absent due to COVID, we're seeing you have increased financial impacts. Similarly, uh, for the sample of employed, if your work remains at home, you're more likely to have these financial concerns relative to if you're if, you, uh, if your work never changed, and if you're completely absent from work, you also have increased financial concerns. Now with this might lose job variable, 
values range from one, I strongly agree that I might lose my job in the next, coming, next four weeks, versus five, I strongly disagree. And so these negative values indicate that you, you, you feel that you will be losing your job in the upcoming weeks. And so this is a highly statistically significant negative. So they, they strongly agree that they might lose their job in the upcoming weeks. Um, and similarly for those who are absent from work, but interestingly, those who can kind of telework or who change their job from outside of the home towards working from home have less of a concern relative uh, to those who have no change in where they live. And so, as again, this is just me trying to push you towards the paper which is coming out. We have additional results uh, in appendices and, and, and in the main script. So we have figures, event studies, robustness checks, and a little bit of heterogeneity for the CPSS and the LFS, all kind of playing on these themes of, of COVID-19 in the general labor market based on occupations and various avenues. And so to conclude, uh, Canada has been hit by COVID-19 and the labor, mar labor market impacts have been quite substantial. And we kind of quantify this across different occupations. Uh, as we see, uh, the pandemic was, their labor market impacts from the pandemic were more severe for workers uh, that work in close proximity of co-workers while less effects were less severe for essential workers and workers that can easily work from home. Um, using the CPSS, we see increased mental health concerns for women, less increase for immigrants, while those uh, absent from work and are facing increased financial concerns and are worried about their job security. And so I thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Right. Okay, so same deal. If the uh, Q and A box isn't working for you, go ahead and just uh, put them in the chat, and uh, we'll all be able to to see them. Thank you, Derek, for uh, for presenting your work. Thanks. I'm looking for my chat, and I cannot. I found my chat. Right, Grant, is it okay if I jump in again? Yeah, yeah, of go course. for it. Oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, you forget it takes some time for people to type. Uh, Derek, that was a great presentation. Thank you both, uh, Ashley, um, for your presentations. I'm just curious, can you just remind me, what was the question about the mental health? I'm sorry, I might have just missed it. So, so I, I think the, I can't remember the exact uh, words for the mental health, but it was something to the effect of how is your perceived mental health? Or like, how is your currently perceived mental health? And so I can actually just go back. Um, and so we have this value from one, which would be poor up to five, which would be excellent in categories. And this is an ordered probit. And we're showing coefficient estimates. And you don't have information on whether uh, the female has a child at home, do you? I'm not sure if we have that. It sounds like something we ought to have. Um, that being said, I've, I've omitted some I've omitted some variables which have no statistical significance, and so I can't remember exactly if it was there, but it's a, it's a good question. Great, thank you. I see a question in the chat, so I'll let, I'll let you answer Why that. not a depression scale questionnaire? Um, so, you know, I, I didn't construct the CPSS, I'm just someone who simply uses it, um, but it's a, I suppose it's a good question, a depression scale questionnaire. So usually StockCan is trying to balance the burden of response with uh, the, the need to get data. So I, I would guess that somebody in the survey construction division just looked at the depression scale questionnaire and, and thought, you know, too many questions, let's just get a self-rated mental health. And, and that seems reasonable to me, especially, it'd be nice because you could do a robustness, right? You could just see if you're picking up the same effects and about the same magnitude. But for, for all extents and purposes, I don't recall there being a depression scale. They must be very long questions since it's <laughs> taking some time. <laughs> Might, um, so, so now that there's a series of, and I, I don't uh, know too, too much about the uh, COVID perspective survey series, um, maybe while we're waiting for other questions, you can walk us through that data source in a little more detail. I don't know how many people are, are intimately familiar with, with what's out there. So the CPSS, uh, was released by StatsCan in early May of 2020. 
I think it was, let me think about this. I believe it was the outgoing rotation from the LFS were asked to answer some of these questions, but I also think it's kind of an open survey. And I, they, I think they queried 36,000, got about 8,000 in total as a response. Everything was done online. I think you could answer in telephone, but for the most part it was done online, um, nationally representative, and that's pretty much it. They're, they're doing various waves of the CPSS asking different questions. And so one of the, I guess, one of the attitudes about the CPSS was trying to tap what's happening in Canada right now and almost, I won't say conveniently, but I'll guess, I guess I'll say, well, I'll say conveniently, COVID-19 was a major thing in, in March. And so they, they released this questionnaire on, on COVID-19. And so respondents answered, I believe, between the end of March and the start of April. So at the start of the pandemic. And so we think some of these uh, questions, like how concerned are you about losing your job in the upcoming four weeks are rather prescient, um, right? It, it's very topical, especially at that period of time. And so we think is a, is a pretty good measure. They've released a couple more waves since. I know the pumps are out on Odyssey and I know you can, you can access them publicly through uh, StatsCan. And so hopefully that gives a little bit of an impetus and a, a plug for the CRDC and, and, and work for researchers or data for researchers to use. So not having seen the specific question, um, you know, in March, I think there was a, a lot more uncertainty around whether you would potentially lose your job or not. I think that that probably settled down. There's probably a lot of variance to the to those estimates. So I, I guess, you know, given what you know about the other waves, is it possible to repeat this analysis when people kind of have a better idea of what to expect? Well, certainly it'd be possible. It just depends on what, it depends on, well, like, I, I don't know if it's feasible, but it would certainly be possible. But at the same time, I, I guess there would be less uncertainty surrounding the, the future. And so I would assume that people would respond. And so you might not be able to get as, not exogenous, but as, as uncertain, but perhaps you would get a better answer. No, it's, it's an interesting question. I know this, yeah, that's an interesting question. I'd, I'd have to think about it more, um, but I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions for Derek. Um, so before we we go, uh, is there anything else burning that that Pierre Lou could come back and answer? Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, especially big thanks to our presenters, uh, Derek and and Pierre Lou. Uh, for coming out to speak to us today about their papers. Uh, we'll look forward to these papers and a slew of other papers in the special COVID-19 issue of uh, the Canadian Journal of Economics. And thanks again to uh, Kate for organizing this with us. And uh, we'll see you all for the next, for the next one.